Ok. Eh, buenos días a todos y todas y todes. Eh, es una alegría enorme estar aquí eh, presentando a Rodrigo Borba. Eh, Rodrigo es eh, profesor en la Universidad eh, Federal de Río de Janeiro. Él, um, él y yo nos conocimos el año 2016 o 2015, no me acuerdo exactamente, en la novena conferencia de la International Gender and Language Association. Uh, Rodrigo um, ha escrito su tesis doctoral sobre el tema de transexualidad eh, y salud en, y transexualidad en Brasil, de donde es él. Uh, un tiempo después publicó un libro en base a, su, a sus uh, hallazgos llamado el desaprendizaje de sí, transexualidades, interacción y cuidado en salud. ¿no? Um, un libro que me encantó, dicho sea de paso, y algún día espero que él me, autoro, me lo firme. <ríe> eh, Rodrigo también tuvo el, el enorme privilegio de ser estudiante de Deborah Cameron en, en Reino Unido, en la Universidad de Birmingham, eh, como parte de su postdoctorado. Y eh, pues nada, creo que otro punto importante es que eh, eh, Rodrigo Borba también es editor actualmente eh, de la revista Gender and Language, eh, a, junto con la profesora Kira Hall y Mie Kiramoto. ¿okay? Bueno, muchas gracias en primer lugar a, a Rodrigo por estar acá. Eh, Rodrigo, podríamos empezar cuando tú gustes. We can start as Anytime. Okay. Thank you for the very generous introduction. I'm very happy to be here with you today. When uh, Ernesto invited me, I said yes promptly because I think this idea of this reading group is quite exciting. So I start apologizing for not speaking Spanish. It's very shameful that Brazilians don't speak Spanish, I know, but I understand Spanish. So you can speak to me in Spanish and I'll then try to reply in a translanguaging way, like Portuguese, Spanish, English. So we can, we can use all the resources we have. We're all linguists here, so we can use all the resources we have. So uh, Ernesto and Siva, thank you for the invitation. So Ernesto told me that you read the paper on colonial impacts. Um, so what I've prepared here is just a small uh, presentation on the paper because you know the paper already, so I, I've just selected some of the most important points to me, and, and I have also included in the presentation things that we did not have the room to analyze, to include in the paper itself, uh, more specifically discourses that resist the kind of um, fetishization that we analyze, uh, the kind of fetishization, that's a difficult, difficult word, and othering that we analyze in the paper itself. So we, uh, in the paper we focus on how uh, coloniality is like, how colonialism is still very much alive in Brazilian media specifically, and how it produces uh, gendered and sexualized others uh, by reviving and reiterating uh, colonial discourses that get naturalized. Uh, but of course, there is always resistance, as Foucault said, where there is power, there is resistance. So, of course, there were some resisting narratives to those um, hegemonic constructions of Fabio Alves body. So I'm going to share my my presentation. Uh, it's quite short, so because I uh, I want to have your your feedback. That's the most exciting part of having papers published because you can talk to people about them. Is it all right? Can you see my screen? Is it sharing properly? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. So, um, just a second. Good. So, the paper itself is uh, the outcome of, a, of an international network 
of research that started roughly in 2016 and, and, was, and was financed by uh, the Danish uh, Research Foundation. So uh, researchers uh, at the University of Copenhagen started this group and the purpose of the research network was to investigate uh, language, gender, sexuality, and materiality in the global south, specifically in the global south. So of course, as the topic of the, the, the research network was materiality, uh, Tomaso and I thought there is nothing more material than the body itself. Uh, so we decided to study how the body, and specifically the male body, is produced in the media, specifically because at the time the research network start, was established, there was, uh, we, I, I was witnessing, I was following the media firestorm about Fabio Alves' uh, buttocks. So basically every a mainstream media outlet reported on the fact that a man had been uh, chosen as a muse of a Samba school in Rio. And of course, Brazil Carnival is one of the most uh, famous export products from Brazil because it attracts lots of tourists. Uh, and another thing that uh, Tommaso and I wanted to discuss was how Carnival itself is based on colonial tropes. It revives colonial tropes specifically related to gender and sexuality. Despite, in spite of the fact that carnival is understood both in academic parlance and in everyday discourse as a time where everything is possible and as a time of partying and everything is possible, that a time when the temporality and meanings of everyday life gets suspended and then everything uh, is acceptable. And then when we look at the firestorm about uh, Fabio Alves' body, we see that not everything is acceptable. So we wanted to, to, to first problematize this depiction of carnival, but then it took us to many other different places. So of course we want to investigate the uh, what um, colonial, uh, decolonial, decolonial thinkers call the coloniality of power. Uh, and that's the definition that Mal Maldonado Torres gives of the coloniality of power. According to him, coloniality refers to long-standing patterns of power that emerge as a, re as a result of colonialism but that define culture, labor, intersubjectivity inter relations, and knowledge production well beyond the strict, the strict limits of colonial administrations. Thus, coloniality survives colonialism. And that's the very important point. What the concept of coloniality uh, undergirds is the fact that colonialism hasn't ended. Colonialism fractures time, as Grada Quilomba refers, uh, describes in her recent book, Plantation Memories. Colonial, uh, colonialism hasn't ended. And because of that, time is not, should not be understood as a linear progression of, 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 of actions, but, in, but it should be understood as a condensed historicity in which, <clears throat> in which colonial understandings uh, and meanings are still present, very much alive, all right? So, uh, <clears throat> so of course, we engage with this, uh, this uh, criticism of coloniality, specifically to understand how colonialism is still a specter, <clears throat> uh, a specter of meaning-making in the global south, and more specifically in a post-colonial Brazil. So uh, Tomaso and I believe that coloniality is not a, an exception or a phenomenon of, of the past, but is capillary. It's per se pervasive and mundane. Um, it's a mundane knowledge matrix of the present, sorry. Uh, and because it is mo so mundane and because it is so old, 
it gets naturalized. And specifically when we refer to media, we don't actually pay much attention to how the media revives and reiterates, reiterates colonial um, forms of representation. Because our gaze is very much accustomed to seeing things the way they are, especially with, refers, with, with uh, regards to gender and race, okay? Uh, because as an outcome of the coloniality of the power, uh, as I just mentioned, our gaze is, gets accustomed to processes of othering. And, and, and these processes of othering that transform gendered, sexual, and racial uh, non uh, racial others as uh, strangers is called by Sarah Ahmed as stranger fetishes, which has very much to do with our embodied uh, actions in, the, in daily life. So according to Ahmed, fetishism involves the, involves the displacement of social relations through the transformation of objects into figures, or in the case that we analyze here, people into figures. Uh, what is at stake is the cutting off of figures from the social and material relations which overdetermine their existence and the constant perception of such figures as having a life of their own. A stranger fetishism is a fetishism of figures. Uh, and this part is very important. It invests this, the figure of the stranger with a life of its own, in so insofar as it cuts the stranger off from the histories of its determination. We need to consider then what are the social relationships involving both fantasy, the social imaginary, and materiality, which in our case has to do with the body, that are concealed in stranger fetishism. So this combination of of a concern with coloniality, how colonialism is very much alive today, and how others are fetishized, fit, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, as strangers, as different than me, the city buys the white uh, colo colonizer that interests us in this paper, that, that, that fascinates us in this paper, and specifically uh, what we wanted to problematize is how the, how the media is still depends on these kinds of representation regimes to, first of all, make money, and second of all, to keep feeding into this history. So, of course, when we study um, uh, the, the processes of othering, of, uh, of, of transforming others as strangers, okay? We have to pay attention to the ambivalent, to, to the ambivalence of the colonial gaze, because they rely very much on regimes of embodied difference. So Ahmed explains the following. The ambivalence of such relationships between human and stranger is not whether strangers are represented as good or bad, or as beyond or within the human, but how they function to establish and define the boundaries of who we are in the very proximity, in the very intimacy of the relation between alien slime and human skin. So uh, what this quote highlights is the fact that the body is very, very much uh, central to processes of othering and especially othering related to colonial um, frames of understanding or matrices of intelligibility, okay? But of course, uh, sorry, good. So this is the theoretical basis for our analysis there. And then how, of course, these were things that bothered us, Tomaso and I, because especially when referring to Brazil as this place of exotic bodies, very sensual bodies, and 
this is a discourse that sells Brazil as a touristic destination, but it also has very material, material effects on how we go, we live our daily lives. All right, so we wanted to study this, this ambivalence and how the media contributes to perpetuate uh, forms of uh, gazing, forms of looking at others as strangers through process, processes of uh, fetishism, okay? So at the time that the research network was established, uh, there was a media firestorm uh, related to Fabio Alves uh, being, having been elected as the muse of the Sunday School. So we decided to study that uh, media representation. But then as the more we delved into the data, the more we, we realized how it, uh, how it repeated forms of representation of, of gendered and sexual and, and racialized others that were not simply contemporary, but also related to very fixed and sedimented uh, ways of interpreting uh, genders and, and racialized others. So we started to uh, we started to to build our data set not only with the news about Fabio Alves' uh, uh, buttocks, because the new the the, the, the that firestorm that that those representations are not don't don't stand uh, by themselves. They need to be historicized. So we went <clears throat> to the history of Brazil and collected documents from uh, colonial Brazil, which refer documents like letters, uh, books, uh, travel, uh, uh, ne travel narratives of, of colonizers, images that represented uh, native Brazilians as savages. Okay, and then of course. Fabio Alves' representations and specifically the way it uh, portrays his bump, all right, in comparison to other, uh, to other, to the way women and men, uh, females, female and male bodies are represented in Brazilian media, okay? So, of course, Brazil is, 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 is famous for, well, the image of Brazil as this place of exotic and sensual bodies is also very much present in this, this uh, representation of regimes that we analyze in the paper. Um, so we also have, we have, of course, print news and, uh, and, and television news about the, how exotic Fabio bodies, Fabio's body looks like to the Brazilian gaze, of course, to the Brazilian colonial gaze. So, um, as as we mentioned in the paper, there was really a, 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 a firestorm of news about the fact that a man with a but with very large buttocks had been chosen to to be a muse of a Sunday school, of course. Uh, if you're not familiar with Brazilian carnivals, Sunday schools, they are very highly hierarchized uh, institutions and they have very fixed, some fixed positions uh, in, the, in the parade. One of these positions is the muse. The muse is usually a woman that is uh, chosen by the members of the Sunday school to represent, to embody the spirit of the Sunday school itself. Uh, in 2015, uh, contrary to the tradition of, of choosing a woman to represent the spirit of the Sunday school, the, 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 to be the muse of the Sunday school, Fabio Alves was chosen to represent him, to, to represent the, 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 the school that he's part of. Uh, and of course, not only is the fact that he's a man uh, innovative here, but also the fact that he has he, a, a very big, a very big posterior, 
factor, right? And of course, the media focus very much on on the the way his masculinity is embodied because you you are familiar with the way male bodies are represented and buttocks are not the central part of this representation of masculinity but the contrary uh, buttocks are indexed femininity okay so uh it started with this first piece of new so news of Porto da Pedra, Porto da Pedra, Porto da Pedra is the, the Samba school, has a, a one a hundred five centimeter buttocks, and then they quote him as saying that he is uh, his uh, body, specifically his buttocks, are frequently uh, commended, praised by the populace. And then in 2017, he was chosen again to be the to be the muse of the Sunday school, but then he appeared with an even larger buttocks. This is interesting in itself, but what makes it, it problematic in a sense is the way his buttocks were represented. All right. Of course you have the uh, the way that he is frequently portrayed in femininized poses or poses or garments that index uh, the wildlife. So our objectives in this paper were to investigate the historical and discursive constructions of stranger fetishes and the, uh, and the others that emerge as its effects to analyze how contemporary media in Brazil reproduce and capitalize on embodied regimes of gendered, sexual, and racial differences, as well as historicize the colonial gaze and problematize its lingering effect in post-colonial Brazil. All right? So, of course, whenever we study history, and specifically from a discursive point of view, we have to be very cautious not to consider history or the coloniality of power itself as a linear uh, phenomenon, because it is not. Okay, uh, we do not. We should not consider history as following this very strict line from past to present to future, because as I as as I said in the beginning, especially within colonial and post-colonial uh, context, time is a very complicated matter, all right? Because as the data we analyze show, colonialism is still very much present in, 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 in the, the way we look at certain people. So uh, instead of understanding history as this linear, progressive uh, movement, we have to, to understand it uh, through fracture, through what Tomás and I main fractured intertextuality and intermittent circulation. Or as Ahmed explains, the question of history can only be posed partially. It is a question that allows us to think about how the relationship between particular encounters and more general processes is not fully determined. determined. A historical approach to the relationship between particular encounters and more general processes require that we, gov that we give up any totalizing thesis about what does and does not determine each, of, each encounter as such. So uh, this word of caution here is just for us to keep in mind that in colonial, in post-colonial, decolonial environments, time is never, uh, is never a unquestioned business. It's always very problematic, very problematic. And this view of this Western view of time as process, as a progression from one thing to the other, is very problematic because it erases the condensed historicity that informs our present. Are you following or, or am I am I going too fast? Should I go, should I slow down? Um, uh, Rodrigo? Yes. 
Yeah, we're listening, but uh, I don't know. Uh, there is like a small e e echo, uh, uh, like some noise in the background uh, in your equipment. I don't know. No, but like, we can like tune see. it. But is, it, is this better? Maybe if I do this, is this better? Uh, so it's fine for me, but I don't know what. Silvia, ¿qué te parece? So we can, we, we can listen, but uh, I feel like there's. It's fine, right? Yeah, I so don't know. We can continue because uh, we also have the, the support of the translation, uh, the transcription feature of, the, of Zoom. Ah, okay. Okay. So I'm yeah, sorry, but, about but that. everybody is, is commenting. They they enjoying your presentation. So. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, yeah. Okay, yeah. So should should I, should I go on? Yeah. Yeah. Go on, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So uh, having this in mind, uh, let's take a look at the data. Of course, we 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 we. we as, as we delve into the data, we noticed that certain colonial uh, tropes were repeated there, and specifically the tropes that produce racialized Brazilians as, um, as those that have very exotic vibes. For example, in the letter of discovery of Brazil, the colonizer Pedro, Pedro Vaz Caminha says the following of the native Brazilians that uh, he met. And this is considered, this letter is uh, historically important because it's considered one of the first uh, descriptions of what the region, the new world, new of course in lots of quotation marks, looks like uh, at the time in uh, 1500. So Peru, the Portuguese says the following, their complexion is their complexion is brown in a way reddish. They have well-shaped skull bones and noses. They are all naked with nothing to cover their bodies. They do not care to cover or to show their shameful parts. And in this regard, they have as much innocence as they show their faces. Uh, so this is the stranger fetishism in its fullest. Right, it, here we see a white European man uh, characterizing uh, the people he had just met as different from them. So this process of othering is, uh, is discursively important here. And he goes on, all right, and he goes on. Uh, the, the other two who the captain brought to the ship and to whom he gave what I already mentioned have never uh, have never come back here, which makes me think <clears throat> that they are sorry that they are beast-like peoples with very little knowledge and and because of this very elusive. Mm -hmm. And this act this is actually a trope that today is still informs understandings of indigenous people in Brazil and our current present uh, our current president. You, of course, know who he is, but I'm not going to say his name because he should remain unnamed. Keeps referring, keeps reviving these tropes when he refers to our indigenous populations as uncivilized, unintelligent, unable to um, to take decisions for themselves, or as Caminha goes on to say in his letter, they are like birds or like irrational wild animals to whom the open air is better than good manners. And Caminha goes on, they now seem more tame than safe among us than we were among them. So the letter, in the paper we analyze a, a different part of this letter in which he just is uh, the female bodies of the indigenous people he met when uh, when um, they arrived. But what what met what is of relevance here is how 
these uh, tropes, and this could be considered the first tropes, because this is the letter of the discovery of Brazil. These are the first tropes, discursive tropes, that characterize uh, Brazilians as exotic and as having exotic bodies. But not only that, but also as different from the civilized white Christian Portuguese. They were like birds or like animals. And this kind of trope is problematic because that's the kind of understanding that legitimizes the, 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 the way uh, both uh, indigenous Brazilians and, and, and Africans to be enslaved, right? Because they were not civilized enough. They had to be civilized. And because they were not civilized, they could be transformed into less than human entities. But of course, as Amontino says, the colonial in the colonial archi archive, even the writers who were against them and enslavement of the natives, the exploitation and the confiscation of their lands, identify them as exotic primitive beings who were deprived of all benefits of civilization. Their values were the canvas on which such characteristics were clearly defined. All right, so even those who later became detractors of slavery is still believed uh, racialized others were less civilized than the Euro European population, European colonizers. And this is clearly seen in how native Brazilians specifically are uh, not only native Brazilians, but also enslaved Africans in Brazil are represented in, in, in the art of uh, in colonial art. So you see here how the native native Brazilians are portrayed as, as cannibals. This is a painting of a Danish uh, artist who visited Brazil in around 1700 and painted lots of similar paintings of of the of our indigenous populations as violent and, and, can, and, and cannibals, right? And here are the, the representation of enslaved Africans as subjects to uh, the, the white man's gaze and violence. But another important thing that the representation of Fabio Alves reverberates, repeats, is the colonial obsession with arses. And, and this can be intertextually linked to how Sarah Bartman has been represented. Of course, Sarah Bartman is, is also uh, known as the Black Venus. It's, uh, she, is, she, she was a, a Croatian woman who became the subject of, of freak shows because of the difference of her body. All right, of course, intersectionality is very important here because it's not only her race that makes her different, but also her gender, all right? To hear, for example, how, uh, how Sarah Bartman is represented in some uh, 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 caricatures of the 19th uh, century, all right? It resembles very much the way Fabio Alves' body was represented here. Because after this, he turns, he turns his back to the man just to uh, show his bum to the onlookers in the, in the reportage, in the live TV program that we analyzed. All right? But his obsession with Arsis uh, is also very much part with the Brazilian history, of the Brazilian colonial history. And this can be, can be seen in one, one of the most important uh, books of sociology, of Brazilian sociology, uh, Gilberto Freire, Masters and Slaves, uh, which, uh, who discusses, uh, well, the purpose of the book is to discuss how, Brazil, how races in Brazil live peacefully together, which is, of course, a lie. This book is also a very important um, 
piece of the history to, of the history of a racial democracy in Brazil, which is not a racial democracy at all. But then Fabi mentions the exotic body of uh, women from Angola. For example, he says that one must bear in mind that the former of these regions, Minas Gerais, which is a state in Rio de Janeiro, which is a state in Brazil, attracted black men who were more prone to working with metals and as such will have a superior culture while the former region, Rio de Janeiro, received sugarcane and coffee planters who were strong and able to work on farms. Even hot and tox Baximantes, Coasians being a people from Angola, with their wide open nostrils and gigantic uh, gluteus. In our opinion, the circumstances explain the better black stock Minas Gerais import. And then he goes on to say, the Sudanese are one of the tallest people in the world. In Senegal, one can see back, uh, we, one can see black men, sorry, black men who are so tall, they seem to be walk, walking on stilts. Skinny, toothy with their angled high, uh, uh, sorry, hierarch, uh, sorry, bodies. If you go, uh, if you go south in Africa, you will find short of rounded, short and rounded people. Women have wide aphrodisia hips, truly grotesque Hottentots and Baximantes show their salient gluteus. This, of course, is quite similar to the way Caminha represented the indigenous people, indigenous women specifically, that met uh, when the Portuguese first arrived in Brazil. <laughs> And this again is also represented in the way Fabius, uh, Fabio, Fabio Baris, Fabius, Fabius Baris, sorry, is, repre is, is represented in the media. For example, this is a common uh, caricature of Sarah Bartman, and here is the way Fabio uh, shows uh, his bum, also intertextually referring to the way Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian's body is represented. Of course, the bomb, as these colonial tropes indicate, big bombs are indexical of exotic femininity, not masculinity. That's why Fabio Alves was very much newsworthy, one should say. But not only the visual representation uh, of Fabio uh, is problematic here. It's not only the visual representation that reproduces colonial tropes, but also the way um, readers of online uh, of online newspapers perform, uh, not perform, but revive the disgust the colonizers felt towards the colonized. So for example, in this uh, exchange, we see lots, lots of references uh, to, to Fabio as sickening, uh, as in the first example. How sickening, a man with a big butt, disgusting. Or Mariella says, uh, Maria, Mariella Ubuquete, who says that Fabio Alves is bizarre and disgusting, uh, ridiculous. Okay. <clears throat> or processes of animalization, which we analyze in the, in the, in the, in the paper, all right? Uh, as we, of course, you remember very clearly that when I mentioned uh, Pedro Vaiz Camina's letter, this, this trope of animalization was quite frequent since the colonial times, but it is still very much alive, all right? For example, here, uh, Fabio Alves is referred to as a pit bull or a lassie, which we analyze in the paper, so I won't go very much into the details of what pit bull and lassie, and lassie mean in the Brazilian context. Someone, someone else calls him uh, a poodle in reference to uh, his sexuality, all right? So it's not just uh, his body that is, that is at stake, the, the, the difference of his body that is, that is at stake but also how his body breaks patterns of the way men's, men are represented in the media, not as masculine and usually with phallic representations. But of course we had in our data some counter discourses 
that we did not analyze for uh, because of the space constraints. Uh, for example, in the same uh, reportage that we that I just mentioned, there were also comments that criticized the way people refer to Fabio to Fabio Alves as disgusting or as an animal. For example, Dandara says that where are the mayor chauvinists? They go crazy, meaning that the, the man uh, go crazy, the, the, the male commenters go crazy for seeing uh, a, a beautiful body. And Juliani Souza says that, don't they? You can only read comments by man, uh, derogatory comments by man. All of them are derogatory, the same way they are towards women. It's a primitive code that has been passing down. What is not part of your group must be undermined. So there were some discourses uh, that problematized both the media representation of Fabio Alves, the hegemonic media representation, mainstream media representation of Fabio Alves, but also on the comment sections. But we didn't have much time to analyze them, much, not time, but space. Sorry. So what this tells us about Carnival specifically, as I mentioned in the beginning, Carnival is usually celebrated as, as a temporary liberation from the prevailing truth and from the established order. It marked the suspension of all hierarchical rank, privileges, norms, and prohibitions. And that thing goes, goes on explaining. The familiar language of the marketplace became as a reservoir in which various speech patterns excluded from official discourse, discourse to freely accumulate. And in spite of the generic differences, all these genres were filled with the carnival spirit, transformed their primitive verbal functions, acquired a general tone of laughter, and became, as it were, so many parts of the carnival bonfire, which renews the road. But, but looking at the data that I have just shown you, does it really renew the, ro the, the road? Is there any renovation in the way uh, Fabio Alves is represented? I don't think so, all right? So of course we have to rethink the way Carnival is represented because it reiterates uh, colonial tropes. It is part, it's one, in Brazil specifically, it's one of the mechanisms through which uh, the coloniality of power works. So the choice of a man was indeed made possible by the suspension of norms that, that Carnival makes possible. However, what we see here is that Carnival is not all party and colors. It also reproduces a specific coloniality of knowledge and of body in which uh, gendered and, and racialized others are produced as stranger. In a way, in, in, a, in, in, in such a way that those who are not, uh, those who are, who are not uh, markedly gendered or racialized are produced as normal, as civilized. Okay, so that's the, that's what I had to say. I hope I didn't go so fast that it could, yeah, I hope my, my, Sound is also better. It is, it is. Thank you. So, um, do you hear me? Do you hear me well? Yes. Me escuchan bien? Ernesto, yo te escucho como con eco o como lejos. Sí, un poco de lejos. So, what about now? Ahora sí, perfecto. Ahora sí, me escuchan mejor. Eh, bueno, en primer lugar, quisiera este, un, una ronda de aplausos para, para Rodrigo por, por su presentación. Sí. Thank Estamos, you, thank este, you. Gracias, gracias. Sí, más bien, muchas gracias. Ha sido, ha sido fantástico este, no solo eh, escuchar tu presentación, sino también encontrar el, el material eh, visual y la recolección histórica desde el tiempo colonial que tú, que tú ofreces, ¿no? que complementa bastante bien esto, Ma, eh, tu trabajo. Más bien, eh, quiero abrir la sala. Eh, lamentablemente, Rodrigo va a estar unos 11 minutos más, entonces voy a priorizar las preguntas de, de quienes estén aquí. 
eh, tal vez podemos arrancar con una pregunta sobre colonialidad que tenía Silvia. ¿O alguien más quisiera intervenir? Yo, yo creo que si alguien quiere intervenir, porque yo había puesto la pregunta sobre el cuerpo pero, y la, lo colonial, pero creo que si alguien tuviera una pregunta inmediata que quiera hacer, está bien, porque creo que Rodrigo lo cubrió bastante el tema. Sí. Um, okay, sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't really hear that the, the sound was very low. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I had a, a question about coloniality that I think uh, Ernesto sent mm -hmm. you already. Uh, that it, that one, in a part of the paper, una parte del paper dice um, that the colonizers didn't make a differentiation between Uh, female and male, male bodies because they saw of, uh, of them as a different species, but less, uh, less than human. Uh, yes, as not human. So I was curious about this and how to relate it to, um, to the female body because also we have uh, past uh, conversations with, um, for example, with Casa de Aguilar, who is a an indigenous uh, linguist, and she's also part of women's movement in her community and indigenous movement. And for her, uh, the the patriarchy pro, or colonization comes with patriarchy a lot. So for me, it was curious to read that different species, but because of the, because also when I read about colonization in Spanish, uh, there were narratives of how the the colonizers rated women and how they depicted women. So I would like uh, if you could uh, go like more into this idea and how you like, how you uh, read about this or how you found it and if you could relate it to this other information that I had. Mm -hmm. Silvia, ¿tú crees que, o tal vez Lara, nos pueden ayudar con la traducción de la pregunta que acabas de hacer, Silvia? Ah, bueno, sí, lo que estaba preguntando, lo que me parece curioso es que en el texto Rodrigo menciona que, el, bueno, Rodrigo y, y, su, y su autor, ¿verdad?, menciona que el, las, los colonizadores, o las personas que colonizaron, veían a las, a las comunidades indígenas como no humanas, y entonces no diferenciaban tanto la parte entre hombres y mujeres, pero o cuerpos de hombres y cuerpos de mujeres, pero le decía que en la conversación con Yasna y Aguilar también hablábamos de cómo había una relación entre eh, la colonia, el colonialismo y el patriarcado, y también sobre textos de la época colonial en las que se hablan de, de violaciones a las mujeres indígenas, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. eh, son narradas por los mismos colonizadores, entonces le preguntaba cómo podríamos asociar estas ideas. Uh -huh. Yeah, one of the, thank you, that's a very interesting question. Um, one of the things that decolonial thinkers, and especially after Ma Maria Lutones, have been discussing is that gender, as we know it today, is a colonial product. So when the colonizers arrived in the New World, as, as we mentioned in the paper, they didn't see the people there or the enslaved Africans as human. But of course, they did differentiate between males and females. They were seen, they were males and females. So much so that the females were constantly raped. Right? What they didn't differentiate was uh, gender specifically. The females were not women and the males were not men. They were simply like animals. They served the wills of the colonizers, right? Of course, this was in the very beginning of, 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 uh, of the colonization period. So in a sense, it's, a, it's an interesting context in which gender and sex are decoupled, right? Because they saw the racialized man as basically not human. They were there to serve their needs. And importantly, also to reaffirm their civilization and super, superiority, superiority, 
That's why we hear, we know of the, the horrors that both indigenous people and, and, and enslaved Africans went through during colonization in Brazil. And in South America, Brazil was the most violent of, of, of the country. If not the violent, but was one of the violent, most violent. Right? But the, the thing is, as Maria Lugoni says, the colonizers, <clears throat> they of course noticed the biological differences between females and males and used those biological differences to uh, further their colonial enterprise, right? But they didn't see, as they didn't see them as human, they didn't see them as gendered. They were simply a biological mess. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have a question. I do you have to run that out? That, no, no, no. Uh, I have a meeting at two. So I'm sorry, but it's so many online meetings. Yeah, uh, but there is time for another question. I can always um, come back to your reading group, so just invite me. Yeah, we will. So, um, uh, Daniela has a question. Um, so, Rodrigo, I was wondering if you could talk a, a bit, a little more about the internal internalization of these discourses, and as it seems to me that there is a certain pleasure in how Fabio Alves presents himself to the public. Actually, I have the same question because if you see uh, the Instagram account of Fabio, he has the very, very, you know, cartoon with a big butt. And yeah. he himself um, uh, uploaded a video of the TV report in his YouTube account. So, so what do you think? Uh, what are your insights about that, Rodrigo? That's another very important and interesting question because in that this kind of internalization uh, also has to do with the coloniality of power. One of the important things that produces, that makes colonialism is still alive is that it gets, it, it has become banal. We don't notice it anymore. It's so old and so naturalized that we don't notice anymore. So this, what we could call internalization is the the performance of the col of colon of the coloniality of power in the flesh, as we could say, right? Because this is we this is repetition. He's basically repeating a matrix that uh, exotifies gendered and uh, racialized others. But it's of course a two way road because he does that the media finds it interesting and he makes money out of that. So we can't, we can't, it's not an, uh, an easily, um, it's not easy to homogenize his actions as simply an internalization of his discourses. But in an interview with me, he told me, yes, I know that this, this is problematic, but that's what makes me, what, that's, that's what earns me a living. Right, so of course it is problematic in and of itself, but the fact that he's got some agency to work the thing from from inside out and say, look, this is problematic, but that's how I make money, mm -hmm. and I need to eat. Mm -hmm. And he actually told me, I can't have this big butt without eating a lot, so I need money to eat. That's what he told me in an interview. So. Mm -hmm. So, and that's an interesting point because the, the complexities of the coloniality of power, they work both, both ways. They also oppress, but in certain contexts, not all of them, but in certain ways, they can foster some kinds of agency. In the case of, 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 of Fabius, in Fabius case, but of course, not all the cases. So that's why the coloniality of power is an important concept for us to understand in today's um, represented media, but also uh, daily acts. Thank you. Uh, Daniela says thank you very much. 
agency seems like a very complex topic here and very interesting. So I also want to thank you. Quiero agradecerte, Rodrigo. Sé que ahora tienes otro compromiso. Queríamos ver otra vez, este, pedir una ronda de aplausos a Rodrigo y agradecerle este, todo esto que nos ha compartido con nosotros. Muchas gracias. Siempre es bien, eres bienvenido al, al grupo. No sé si quieres thank hacer you. algún anuncio. Yes, thank you. I'm sorry I couldn't stay longer because like now everything happens online, so people schedule meetings all day long. So I'm really <laughs> sorry. But whenever you, 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 you want to, to, to discuss some of my work, just invite me. It will be a pleasure to be with you. That will be awesome. Thank you. And also on Tuesday, by the way, on Tuesday, just, just as you asked me for an, an announcement, on Tuesday at 7 o'clock Rio, 7 p.m., I'll give a talk on, on queer linguistics in Brazil. So if you, if you would like to attend, that, that's, that's going to be nice. This is one of the advantages of being online. So we can be with other people everywhere, anytime. So it's interesting. OK, thank you. And then you. If, you have, if you have questions or comments about the paper, just send me an email. I'll, I'll be glad to hear what you think. Thank you again. Muchas gracias, Rodrigo. Bueno, tenemos que despedirnos entonces, pero la conversación va a continuar en el círculo yes. y voy a, voy a detener el, el, la grabación ahora.